Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our song service this Sabbath morning. We hope that you will join in and sing with us as we start out with hymn number 508, Anywhere with Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to know that regardless of what we face, what trials, temptations, scary, uncertain situations, that we can face them with Jesus by our side? is going to be 593 in times like these. In times like these, we definitely need a savior.
So for our next song, we would like to sing hymn number 526, Because He Lives. Oh, how wonderful it is to know that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Welcome once again to our worship service, to a very special part where we get to meditate on spiritual things, on God's word, and who we are as a church. So before we begin, please allow me a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with my friends things you've shown me from the scriptures um, that we need to relate to as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists. And as we begin this new series, I, Lord, trying to explore what is the heart of Seventh-day Adventism in the context of all the brothers and sisters that we share in, the, in this Christian faith, especially, Lord, in light of everything that's happening around us. So, Father, please, through your Spirit, make this a blessing to everyone that hears. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting a, a series entitled The Heart of Adventism. It is not a sermon series that's necessarily for Seventh-day Adventists. Actually, this is a series that will help you if you have, you're married to a Seventh-day Adventist or your son or your daughter is a Seventh-day Adventist and you're wondering, what is that about? What, is, what do they really believe? Um, this series actually is to help others understand what is at the heart of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
If you know of Seventh-day Adventists, you may know that you know our churches are open on Saturday, not on Sunday. And uh, maybe that's all you know. Maybe you know a little bit more, etc. But um, it's not just simply for us as Adventists to get a grip of who we are, but also to explain our brothers and sisters of other denominations to help them understand a little bit about ourselves. If you really want to understand something, it's best to just go directly to the person and not to Google YouTube, um, as we might be tempted to do. So this may is not going to be a comprehensive attempt in trying to explain everything, but at least the heart, the core of why I am a Seventh-day Adventist, why your husband or your son or your aunt or your grandma shares this faith. So I hope it will bless you as well. I'm going to begin by telling you a story that um, is a little bit of an embarrassing story. Um, by the grace of God, I've never gotten a, a ticket, speeding ticket, parking ticket, none of those. I thank the Lord for that. Um, but this happened on June 9th. It was a Saturday evening. I still remember it. I was driving my hot rod, my Hyundai Accent. That was my college car, faithful little uh, car that I had. And the year was 2007. This is a very important date. Um, my friend Fredito and I, we were driving around trying to run some last minute errands. And we were driving behind the osteopathic hospital in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, it's a straight road and I was trying to skip the, the lights. But I didn't realize that I was not just skipping the lights in the main road. This is a back road. I was also skipping the stop signs. <laughs> Um, I went through the first one, and Fredito, who was going to become my brother-in-law the next day, looked at me and was like, um, did you just see that? And I'm like, oh man, sorry. Yeah. And as I'm saying that, I'll go through a second stop sign. And he is just like, brother, what are you doing? And uh, as soon as I said, man, brother, it's just do, do, do. I hear behind me the the sirens and I see the Christmas lights, the red and blue behind me. And I pull over and I'm like, oh great, out of all the nights. I was getting married the next day. My brain was just out there. Uh, all these things that were gonna be happening, all these changes. So I had my driver's license and my um, registration card and insurance, proof of insurance. As soon as the officer walked up to the window, I, I handed that to him and um, he looked at me and was like, uh, do you know why I'm pulling you over? They always ask that, right? Do you know why? Are you even aware? I said, um, I believe I went through two stop signs, officer. And he's like, okay, so you, you do know. Yes. Sir, are you under the influence? Are you inebriated? Have you been drinking anything? And I was like, no, officer. Um, so what, what happened? And I'm glad he was asking questions. He didn't, he didn't just give me a ticket. Uh, I could have said a whole bunch of things. Oh, my brain, I just can't concentrate, whatever. I was also going to nursing school, by the way. Um, it's not a good idea to be getting married as you're going to nursing school. But I simply said, I'm getting married tomorrow, officer. And my brain's not with me right now. That's it. The officer paused and said, he was a young guy. He said, um, listen, I got married six months ago. I know exactly what you're saying. Don't worry about it. Just drive carefully, <laughs> make it home quickly. Uh, and have a happy day tomorrow. So that was it. He said, here's your ID back. And I was like, Phew. Fredito was like, this doesn't happen in Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if it happens or not. Maybe it didn't happen to him. But uh, for me, as I saw the police officer drive away, and um, I'll be honest with you, I almost ran through a th third stop sign. Except that Fredito this time was like, hey, right there, right there, you need to stop. There's one coming right there at that corner. Um, but I thought about this business of the ID. Um, the officer asked me, ID please. And I gave him this Pennsylvania issued driver's license that lets me drive anywhere in the United States. Um, now I have one from Michigan. But you know, that driver's license basically told him I needed corrective lenses. It was listed right there. And we talked about this in a previous sermon, how I got those glasses. Um, that I'm an organ donor and uh, eye, eye color, etc. cetera. Um, but that's it. That's, that's all it is in some numbers and a photograph, of course. But that ID really is, is 
just a superficial thing. It's an external thing. Anyone's driver's license, your driver's license, when a police officer picks it up, the driver's license will not say he is a good, responsible driver. This is very unusual. Nor will it say you need to arrest this person, <laughs> take him in right now, now that you have him. Um, the driver's license will not reveal your heart. And when the officer said, you know, when I told him I was getting married, and he said, yeah, me too, I know exactly what you feel. He didn't immediately say, well, can I have your uh, qualified to get married license? See, I have to get a driver's license before I can get, be I can get, before, um, I can get behind a, a, a car and drive um, for safety precautions. But have you seen the tests that you have to take for marriage? They have some, but very, very few people take those. And uh, most that I've had as a pastor come to me like when the wedding's already planned, the, the gown's been bought, the photograph, the photographer, everything else has been done. And then kind of like a little addendum. Oh yeah, the, the counseling, the preparation for the actual real thing. Um, but there's no driver's license being given, right? When people get engaged, will you marry me? <gasps> yeah, wait a second, do you have a license? The, the, the fiancé doesn't ask that to the groom, right? Future groom. On their wedding day, the pastor, the minister doesn't say, can I see your IDs, please? I want to see the condition of your heart. Are you committed? Are you faithful? Those are things that we cannot produce. And that's why they don't exist. And that's why that, that uh, police officer, all he could say was, ID, please. What identifies you? And it's all an external thing. It's all an external, uh, outward uh, thing that reveals nothing really except that I'm allowed to do these things. Whether I run through stop, uh, red lights, whether I run through stop signs on a regular basis, etc., it doesn't say anything like that at all. Well, getting married is the same thing. And it made me think, you know, you can get a marriage license, but that doesn't mean you'll be a good husband or a good wife. It doesn't reveal your heart. All of these licenses and permits that we get are only external uh, revelations that someone has allowed us to uh, have these privileges or rights. The reason we cannot produce these deeper inner licenses or permits is because only God can provide those things. And in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, you see a whole bunch of IDs that God would give His people. Things that were external, but God ne never gave an external uh, ID, identification, simply to, for it to remain external, it was supposed to be a reflection of something that had happened inwardly. Uh, you had sacrifices. Some of these were unique. Abel, Noah, Abraham. I mean, Abel and, and uh, his brother Cain, right? They were both offering sacrifices. But the sacrifice that Abel offered identified him. It was an ID. He offered a lamb. He offered a sacrifice that symbolized, that pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And God accepted that ID. When God would say to uh, Abel, what's your ID? He would point to the sacrifice and God would say yes. But when he would go to Cain and say, what is your ID? The sacrifices that Cain would give, God would not accept. In the same way that that police officer, as he, as he says, ID please, and I give him a driver's license from Argentina or other parts of the world, or I give him a credit card, that would, that would really go down bad, wouldn't it? Or some money, <laughs> that would not be good. Um, God had IDs. Actually, he has IDs all throughout the scriptures. A circumcision, you may be very, very well of this, uh, Abraham and onwards. This was an outward uh, ID that God gave his people. The Sabbath was present in the Garden of Eden already and it carried over into humanity's experience. And it was ratified and brought back to their attention at Mount Sinai. It's not the first time that it, it came to exist. It, had, it already existed in creation. Wardrobe, the way that the priests, even the Israelites were supposed to dress. They, they had the, the specific guidelines that even the outward attire would uh, distinguish them from the, their neighbors. But in a special way, the priests, the Bible says that they were to be dressed for beauty and for holiness. Even within the camp, the, the way that they dress would identify them, identify them as having a special function um, and a form of ID. Uh, you have diet, uh, Daniel in, in Babylon, 
and of course the book of Leviticus with Israel as a whole. You have baptism. In the Old Testament, Paul says that when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, that was a symbol or a type of the New Testament baptismal experience. In the New Testament, of course, you have John the Baptist um, and later on Jesus and his disciples. In the book of Revelation, you also have IDs. You have again clothing, uh, white robes, and then you have something extremely special, God's name written on the foreheads, uh, the seal of God. Those are the things that in the end times, God also has IDs. And we, we're going to be studying those throughout this series. But I want to begin to set the groundwork in that this is not unique. When people talk about the mark of the beast or the seal of God, some very real uh, things that are in the Bible that speak of realities that will be manifested and I believe are being manifested even now. We need to understand them, but we can't understand those if we haven't spent time studying these from the past. Um, and lastly, you have some negative IDs in the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast, which we will also be looking at. But like I said earlier, God did not simply, God could have given them a driver's license or an Israelite license. You know, if you carry this, you are my people. But what he gave them was circumcision and sacrificial systems and the sanctuary and the, the Ark of the Covenant and all these other things. And yes, they were all external. But we know for a fact from the Old Testament alone, they were not supposed to be only external, but rather they would only be real. They would only be legitimate if they agreed upon with the inner experience of the individual. The sacrifices, as we said earlier, between Cain and Abel, they, they were an outward exercise that revealed inner faith in God's saving grace and love. And that's what God could accept Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. Circumcision, later on in Jeremiah, God would clarify and Paul would expound in Romans chapter 1 and 2 where God would say, I, I'm not, it wasn't really the circumcision of your body, but the circumcision, circumcision of your heart. That's what I wanted, your heart to be circumcised. So again, in the Old Testament, God would, would complain. All you're showing me is an external ID, when in reality, I wanted you to have it inwardly before you even had it outwardly. Um, the Sabbath was supposed to be an emblem of sanctification, a demonstration of God's creative power transforming my heart. That was the, the inner experience of Sabbath, resting in the works and the power of God. You had priestly clothing, uh, inner holiness. You had a diet, a, a real regard that, that we're not separate entities, that as we will study about uh, the, the Bible teachings and what we as Seventh-day Adventists have come to learn from the scriptures, we're not separate entities of here's my body, here's a soul, here's a spirit, and those three entities are together me. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that what I do to the body affects me spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually even. Because Paul says, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. And he proceeds that with, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? So all of these things will hope, hopefully help you understand why Seventh-day Adventists practice some of these external things. They're not supposed to be external only, of course. They're supposed to be a reflection, a, a demonstration that there's something going on inside, something that the grace of God has done inwardly. I want to glorify God by taking care of the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. So this idea of external IDs, God did provide them, but again, under the understanding, with the understanding that if you accept circumcision, if you accept these things, if you accept these realities, external realities, is because you have accepted by faith the inner working of my power in your life. Today, unfortunately, Christianity, uh, by departing, I, I, we've always done this. In the Old Testament, is replete of God's people constantly, you know, veering off, veering off this way. We're no better in the Christian uh, era, in the Christian time. Um, we have, you know, the, the book of Acts and the, the first century Christians, second century Christians, but by the time we get to third, fourth century Christianity, it begins to shift, it begins to change. And when Constantine makes Christianity legal and part of the Roman Empire's uh, religion, the religion of the empire, Christianity takes a very different turn. And we don't have time to go into all of that. Um, maybe throughout the series, I'll bring some more details in that regards. 
But what has ended up happening is because of that departure from Scripture, and that is one of the core um, tenets of Seventh-day Adventists, we, we have to base everything on Scripture. And we're not unique in that. Uh, other religions, other denominations affirm that as well, and we're glad for that, the Baptists, the Methodists, etc. Um, but unfortunately, um, many people take extra things and add them to the Scriptures. What has ended up, ended up happening is, um, as the Catholic Church um, diverted, and that's why we have Protestantism, you may not even know why you have an external ID, right? There are many Adventists that if you ask them what is Seventh-day Adventism, they'll say it's a really long name. Man, I wish we were just Baptists, right? Just one word, Seventh-day Adventist. Um, that's all they know. Unfortunately, many Baptists don't know either. Uh, many Pentecostals, many Methodists, many Lutherans, many Catholics. There are some that do, and I want to affirm them for taking ownership of their uh, spiritual heritage. But as a whole, many people don't know what it means to be a Protestant. Have you ever wondered why you don't have the, the Protestant church? It's because we're all Protestants. Methodists, Adventists, Baptists, Anabaptists, Lutherans, we're all Protestants. And so under the canopy of the various denominations, all of us fall under this Protestant um, category because we protested that the Catholic Church diverted from Scripture. And because the, the Roman Catholic Church diverted from Scripture, they didn't really divert. What they did is they uh, developed traditions, church traditions, and then the church traditions began to take more and more importance in church life as opposed to the Scriptures. And um, sorry, I just wanted to carry this for the sermon. But the scriptures and then tradition became almost the same. And eventually, tradition interpreted scripture. The, the church traditions superseded the scriptures. And it's not original what the Roman Catholic Church did. And it's not something that we should say, oh, those evil individuals. The, the Jews in the time, the religious leaders at the time of Christ did the exact same thing. Jesus could say to them in Mark chapter 7, you make void the commandments of God by keeping your traditions, the traditions of man. We're prone to do that. And I think every denomination is guilty at some point of doing that. So uh, when the Catholic Church diverted in that direction, the Protestant Church has gradually been seeking to restore what has been lost. That's why we exist. As a Methodist, I hope you understand that that's why you exist. And where I'm pastoring out at now in the Cadillac Church, as I drive around, I see uh, a lot of churches in the Cadillac and Lake City area, which is a good thing. People want to go to church. People value church. Amen for that. But do you know why you go there? And more than that, right? Why does the Seventh-day Adventist Church do, do things a little different than the rest. That's why this series, I, I feel impressed to do it at this time so that as a pastor of another denomination, uh, as a f fellow laborer in the ministry, you will have a better understanding of why we are there. I'm gonna to read to you some statistics from the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, research that they've done, and this is a bit dated. It's from the 2000, year 2006. In the United States, of course, there's more now. But as of 2006, in the yearbook of U.S. and Canadian churches, there were 217 different denominations. But when you go worldwide, that number goes up to 9, over 9,000 denominations. Um, and so you can understand why the Roman Catholic uh, brothers and sisters would say, look at you guys, look how fragmented you are. That's what, that's what happens when you leave the mother church. You should come back. And you, I can understand why they would say that. You know, you, you're giving Christianity a bad name because people will look at the, the different denominations and will feel discouraged. Um, but what I would say to our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church is, why are you there? And are you united really? Because not even the Roman Catholic Church is united. There's controversies and conflicts. You know, some people want... Uh, female priests, others don't. Uh, some people want the, the removal of the celibacy vow for priests. They want priests to be able to get married. And there are segments that actually do that. 
So there is no real, you know, homogeneous, cohesive unity, even within the Roman Catholic Church, if, if we're honest about it. But regardless of all of that, Roman Catholic, Pentecostal, Baptist, uh, Anabaptist, Lutheran, you name it, the 214, 217 churches that we have, or more denominations, those are all external IDs, and we kind of develop them ourselves. Um, it's not that God assigned those, and I don't think God really wanted, for sure, 217 plus denominations sprawl around Canada and the U.S. Um, what God wanted was growth. What God wanted was a continual examination and a refusal to say we've arrived, which is why many of these denominations exist. And we will look at that through this series. But we want to start out with challenging every single one of us, especially Seventh-day Adventists, because I am a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, though we can call ourselves Christians, we'll begin to see the broad effect of the church's general departure from the vital inner ID and the seduction of only outward IDs, rites and ceremonies that are done outwardly as somehow be being the all in all and replacing the true emphasis of an inner experience. Um, individuals that look at the church today are the, the younger generation that look at the vast variety and differences of denominations um, will have two experiences. They'll have an obstacle because which one? You know, I flip the channel and this pastor from this church says, this church teaches the truth from the Bible, 100% undiluted truth. And you'll turn to another channel and that same pastor will say the exact same thing. And you ask me and I will tell you the exact same thing. I only teach from the Bible. I only teach from the Bible. So why do you go to different buildings? Why is your, your ID, your external ID saying this and your external ID saying that and your external ID saying that? Who, who's real? Who's got the real ID? So it becomes an obstacle. And many young people say, forget that. I don't want to have to pick. Uh, I'll just pick something completely different. You know, it's like a town. Uh, imagine Cadillac with only Mexican restaurants, right? And all of them are telling you, we're the authentic Mexican restaurants, right? Um, how are you going to go? Which one are you going to go? And you only have Mexican to choose from. You may want to try this one and you like this one because your dad went there and your grandma went there and so that's where you go there. But then someone shares with you a taco from the, the restaurant across the street and, you street and you're like, mm, this taco is way better than th these tacos. And you go across the street and you've changed Mexican restaurants because of a taco and because they have better mar mariachi music. But you know, from Mexican to Mexican to Mexican to Mexican to Mexican, someone, someone might one day call and, or, or approach you and say, have you ever tried Italian? What? And because your town only has Mexican restaurants, you'll be like, forget it, trying to find the real authentic Mexican restaurant. I'm just gonna go and try Italian. Many of the young adults and the youth that are growing up as Christians in Christian homes, when they see, and they are not blind to this, some of the churches, even here in the Detroit area, I'm still here trying to relocate myself up north, but here in the Detroit area where, where I've been pastoring now and transitioning over to the Cadillac, when our young people go to church, it, 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 that does not escape them. The fact that right across from our parking lot is another church, another group of individuals that claim to believe things from the same Bible, but they go to that restaurant and I come to this restaurant. Why do you go to your restaurant? Why do you go to your church? We all can easily be seduced by only the external IDs, a name, a title. I'm a Lutheran. Why? Because your mom, your dad, your wife, your parents? And is that sufficient reason? Is that sufficient reason even for you to say, this is what I am? Externals never replace the inner. And some individuals uh, actually will go a step further and say, Forget Christianity altogether. Um, I think they're all wrong because if they can't even agree amongst themselves, they're probably all wrong. So forget with Christianity. I prefer atheism. I prefer that to believe that there is no God because if there is one, he wouldn't have so many fragmented believers all fighting with each other saying, I am, I am, I am. 
So this multiplicity of denominations can become an obstacle and can become a discouragement that leads people to just reject Christianity altogether. So this is a very important subject, especially at the time we're finding ourselves to be in in history. Some Christians with well good intentions have said, well, maybe the problem is the denomination, maybe it's the label. So we have, we've had for the past couple of decades this uh, growth of non-denominational churches. Have you heard of those? Non-denominational churches. You know, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, we had a pizzeria called the No Name Pizzeria. And when you got the box, it said big letters, No Name Pizzeria. You know what the problem is with that mindset is that that's the name. <laughs> that's the, the name of the pizzeria, No Name Pizzeria. And you know what the problem is with non-denominational? That's the denomination. You are a non-denominational denomination. It's just trying to play around with the reality of well, forget all of these different uh, Mexican restaurants. We are the non-Mexican Mexican restaurant. I hope you understand the, the point. I think that is a better path. I think the Bible presents to us a better path. And it begins with you and I asking ourselves those questions that I've already asked you. Why are you there? Why do you sit on a Seventh-day Adventist pew when there's a lot of beautiful churches around the area with a lot of beautiful Christians surrounding us? Why aren't you on Sundays in their churches? Because of an external thing? Because of a day? Because of why? See, and this is where the, um, the gospel confronts humanity from day one, from the moment sin entered, and we began to express our faith as Cain and Abel came to God expressing their faith. One came with an idea that God said, I can accept that. But another one came to the same God with an idea that God said, that is only external. I need something internal. What, do you, what would you say to God? What would God say to you with the ideas that you would present to Him when He would come to you and say, I need to see your gospel ID. I want to see what identifies you, yourself, to yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ. So we have a, uh, an opportunity now, and I'm not going to spend too much time, at least in this sermon, I can't spend too much time with other denominations. I will focus more on the one that I want to hold accountable, the, the, the denomination that I pastor in, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you need to know this if you are a pastor of other denominations or if you have family that belongs to other denominations. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church didn't just appear out of nowhere, out of a vacuum. We actually, our initial birth was by a, a Baptist pastor named William Miller. So we have strong Baptist roots within Seventh-day Adventists. You may not know that. Uh, James and Ellen White, they are one of the founders of Seventh-day Adventists. Um, Ellen White came from a Methodist background, and James White came from a Christian Connection background. So we were not just Seventh-day Adventists from the get-go. That didn't come till some dec a decade and a half later from when we first started gathering and studying about the second coming of Jesus. But our roots are there. It is part of our DNA. We have strong Baptist roots in that we believe strongly and defend vehemently the, the authority of scriptures, the historicity of scriptures, the literalness of the Genesis account from Genesis 1 through 11. All of those things are near and dear to us, and that's part of the heritage that we appreciate so much from our Baptist brothers and sisters. The Methodists, the, the, the way that they study the Bible, which is a methodical system of comparing scripture with scripture. We love that. So those are part of our DNA. So we're not just all together separate, you know, way out there, um, we have a lot of other denominations that is part of our DNA as well. But even for us, this same question is just as poignant as anyone else belonging to the 217 plus denominations across the U.S. and Canada. God to each of us says, ID please. ID please. Not that he knows to see it, but we need to examine whether we have the, the legitimate heart manifestation of the ID God is looking for, what identifies us. Um, some of the things that are uh, very core within Adventism is our mission. And our mission is not unique, it's evangelism. We are huge on evangelism. It's one of the reasons we've grown so much. We emphasize that and we hasn't, haven't emphasized it as much as we should have and some of the emphasis have, have been, uh, anyways. We're getting better. We're still improving in the process. Um, but 
evangelism is huge, but we're not unique, like I said. You, you may know Billy Graham, right? World-renowned evangelist, and, and we affirm and, and are thankful for his ministry and the many he has led to Christ um, through the Crusades for Christ events that he has. And I've subscribed to Christianity Today, which is amazing that he started. He was the founder of it. Uh, but as Adventists, one of the reasons we're having this event called Hope Awakens that starts uh, soon is with the hopes of people understanding the truth. Because it's not simply that we go out there saying, you know, whatever we want to say. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe God has called us to present the truth. And if, if you belong to any denomination, any Christian denomination, um, your denomination may be growing more and more uncomfortable with that statement, the truth. We are too. Some within us are, are becoming uncomfortable with the truth because we are being affected by relativism and pluralism, where someone coming to you and telling you that they have the truth is, is an arrogant statement. Like, well, how do you know? Or the statement that, well, that's awesome that you've discovered your truth. Don't bother me with my truth. The, the world has shifted in that regards, and that's why denominations feel uncomfortable with the idea that here's a church that claims to be preaching the truth. Some of the Adventists, we believe that God has asked us to preach the truth, but the truth should be offensive to any Christian, including some of the Adventists, if the truth simply means or really is detached, disjointed, and disconnected fact from the Bible. Um, I've heard evangelists from all different kinds of denominations uh, preach horrible, disconnected sermons in which they are presenting facts of evolution versus Christianity, the facts of Jesus' historicity, and, and they present it in a very compelling, intellectual, correct kind of manner, but disconnected. Disconnected, at least, from the gospel. Disconnected from Jesus Christ. That's not the truth. As some of the Adventists, we believe that um, we are not called to do this in a vacuum, but that actually we're standing on the shoulders of centuries of godly individuals from the various churches, from the various denominations, who have also been called by God to do exactly what we feel we've been called by God to do. From within the Roman Catholic Church, John Huss, he felt compelled, convicted to give masses in the language of the people, in the common language. And they loved to hear John Huss, and he was a Roman Catholic priest. Martin Luther, uh, he was not a Lutheran. <laughs> Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. And uh, the, the, the idea that you know, the Bible, the Sola Scriptura, came to him while he was still a Roman Catholic. Um, he was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church because he refused to let go of what his faith had laid a hold of. The just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1. So this, this idea that Seventh-day Adventists feel that we've been called to preach the truth is not a, a boast like we're the only ones. We should be at least very much aware that we have not been the only ones. Um, that there are many who have gone before us, and many who are many in other denominations who are also studying the scriptures with the same desire, not simply to present disconnected, disjointed facts from the Bible, but I've left something out from the statement of the truth. The truth about God. The Seventh-day Adventist Church what compels us to preach, what compels us to do public events, and what compels us to invite and entreat people to come and hear the gospel is because we feel convicted that as we've gleaned from that rich heritage that we have behind us, starting with the Roman Catholic Church and onwards through the Lutherans and the Anabaptists, etc., etc., all throughout the centuries, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants of the faith, Calvin, etc., uh, Wesley's, all of those individuals. And we are now still in this trajectory. We haven't arrived. That's why I love the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, we believe that we don't know everything. We as a church uh, assert the fact that we haven't discovered everything that there's to be discovered in the Bible. That's why our church steers away from creeds and dogmas. Because we see them as, they're not that they're bad, but they could be bad. It's like bones, right? Bones are calcium. They're, they're strong. They need to be solid and immovable, right? But they also need to be flexible. 
And the moment you, the moment you start calcifying your joints, you start losing mobility. And for me, that, that's a metaphor of what happens when a church chooses to say, we've arrived, therefore let us calcify ourselves in this dogma or this creed that will become immovable, uh, ir ir irreversible. Well, what if there's something in there that needs improvement? Because the truth about God, I mean, how can a church claim to have arrived at that? That's borderline blasphemous. Does your church believe that it knows everything there is to know about God or that we can still discover more beauties about God? And that's what the Seventh-day Adventist Church holds dearly, that we are in this directory. We've barely begun to scratch the surface and in eternity, we will still be learning about this awesome God we serve and His amazing grace that saves us. Um, I know that within our, my church, there's individuals that are present I believe in every other church as well, every other denomination that dig their heels when a church wants to do outreach or evangelism. Um, maybe for a legitimate reason because of how they've seen evangelism being done in the past. When we were bopping people over the heads or screaming you know, from the pulpit or pounding the pulpit and wagging our fingers in people's faces. And they're like, uh, <laughs> I'm a, I don't want to invite my friends to have someone's fingers wagged at their face. And I've been guilty of that. And I've repented of that. Um, I think that with this idea of absolute truth, the truth about God, the way that our world has affected us, it, we may think that someone telling us, hey, you need to come and hear the truth, as someone that already has um, ascribed to themselves a superiority complex. We know more than you. Come, you, you know, nincompoop, hear it from brilliant people like us. And because it comes across that way, many people from within the Seventh-day Adventist Church and probably other churches as well, they're a bit uncomfortable because we don't want to sound arrogant. But you know, Luther didn't want to sound arrogant, and neither did Luther. Um, this idea that if I come under the conviction that there's something clearer, as I've studied, and there's something that, man, here's something that explains it better, I should share that. Um, it's actually biblical. In Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26, it says, uh, Acts 18, 24 through 26, is a powerful verse. This gave me so much uh, encouragement when I was church planting in Columbus, Ohio. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was mighty in the scriptures. He could quote scriptures. He knew Torah backwards and forwards, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the Psalms. He knew this. He was a mighty man in the scriptures. And uh, he was taught in the way of the Lord. And he was fervent in spirit. He was passionate, full of conviction. He spoke and taught, and here's the word, accurately. Apollos was a man mighty in the scriptures, anointed with the Spirit, preaching, and he taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This is the Protestant Reformation. Actually, this was supposed to be Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church, our dear brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, should have listened to this verse and said, we haven't arrived yet. Let's be careful with dogmas. Let's be careful with this idea of infallibility because we are very much fallible. The only thing that is infallible is God's Word. And my puny, tiny little brain needs to approach it with deep humility because today I can teach it accurately but tomorrow, someone may come to me and teach me more accurately the way of the Lord. And so we've seen this trajectory repeated over and over and over and over throughout history. Luther, you know, the just child by faith, praise God, the anchor point, that, that foundation, that immovable foundation, because it's from Scripture, not from Luther. But, you know, you go a little bit forward into history, and you have the Anabaptist. And the Anabaptist believed that you know, from Scripture that you yourself have to make the act, make the choice of repenting and expressing that repentance through baptism. So they 
understood from that that if you're going to make that choice you have to make that choice your parents can make that choice for you when you are a baby you have to make that choice as an older person and there's more theology behind there it's not as simple as that um, for the sake of time I'm just simplifying it from history but the Lutherans saw the Anabaptists refusing to baptize their babies and began to persecute them the Lutherans just like the Catholics should have looked at this verse and said maybe we need to be like Apollos though we have been teaching accurately the way of God maybe there is a more accurate way to teach it or understand it you know I wrestle with that that's that statement he taught accurately he doesn't say he taught kind of accurately it's like 2 plus 2 equals 4 how can you get more accurate than that well we're not doing math we're doing God's character we're doing the infinite eternal almighty all-powerful God and we want to say we've arrived and that's my appeal to you as a Seventh-day Adventist. Sometimes we act like there's nothing more to learn. Sometimes we feel that we're secure because of an outward ID. When Jesus says, show me your ID, and make sure I need to cover my numbers, <laughs> show me your ID, I hope you just don't give him a title or a denomination. And I say the same thing to you as a Baptist, as a Christian reform, as a Catholic, as a Lutheran, whoever you may be watching this. When Jesus asks you for an ID, what will you give him? A Lutheran? I'm an Anabaptist. I'm a Roman Catholic. Those are external. Apollos. He was mighty in the scriptures, anointed by the Spirit, and he was teaching accurately. And when Priscilla and Aquila come to him and humbly, respectfully, beautifully, biblically, share with him more accurately, Apollos doesn't persecute them. Apollos doesn't ridicule them. Apollos doesn't shame them or, or do all these things to invalidate their point. Apollos recognizes it is biblical. Or like the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, after Paul teaches them, they went home and studied the scriptures. Do you do that after a sermon? I hope my members will do that after my sermons. I hope, I hope they'll go back and not simply say, well, Pastor Ariel, he's nice. You know, he's never gotten a ticket. Certainly, he must be a good pastor. Hey, he's got a ministerial license, right? Certainly, he must be a good pastor. Because when you have a driver's license, certainly that means you are a good driver. And just like when you have a marriage license, it must mean you are a good husband, a good wife, right? The truth about God matters what we say about God matters because it's two sides of the same coin on one end you have God through his grace revealing what he does to humans and humans comprise the church and so because God acts upon a human being and this is the coin God acts upon a human being now this human being has the opportunity and responsibility of describing how this God has acted and who this God is. And when I describe this God, others will hear me and say, well, that's how that God must be. And like I said earlier, there's a reason why throughout history, people have rejected the living God, the God of the Bible, not because of the seductions of idolatry, not because of secular pursuits, the only reason why they rejected accepting and believing in God is because of what the church taught about God. You have to think about that. There are people today that are atheists and they will tell you, I'm an atheist not because I went to a secular university or a secular college. I'm an atheist because I heard the sermons from the pulpit from my church. And the way they describe God as this individual that would do these things and do that things and he would condemn these people and he would pour judgment on those individuals. I want to tell you that having church planted in various places and as an evangelist in various places and as a pastor in various places, I'm inviting you to stay with this series, especially if you are non Seventh-day Adventist, if you are from another denomination, because you may have been told things about God. And as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I would love to have an opportunity for you to hear 
more accurately. Things about predestination, things about hell, death, and the second coming of Jesus. All of those things matter, but not isolated and separated. All of these things, those, those things matter when you put them together. And because it's one puzzle, the pieces should fit. And it would be my presentation, it would be my argument that, like Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos, that how many Christians or how some individuals or somehow some, some denominations present some of these topics on predestination, on eternal hell, on death, on the second coming, doesn't fit the puzzle. It doesn't fit the puzzle that the Bible provides for us. And I humbly appeal to you that you, you would hear us out. You would give the Seventh-day Adventists an opportunity to explain the heart of Adventism. Like you, we share the same passion, sharing the gospel with others, telling about others about Jesus. I pray for the other pastors in the area. I'm part of the ministerial association and I pray for them. They're men and women like me that want to share Jesus with others. But what I share about Jesus, what I share about God, could have implications that I never make the connection. This person is rejecting God because of what I'm teaching him, what I'm teaching her, is what I am teaching from the Bible, from the Bible. We may be surprised. We need to conclude. So Jesus is asking us, can I see your ID, please? Can I see your ID, please? You're behind the car. Certainly, you must have a license. Certainly, you must have a driver's license. Can I see your ID, please? You're in a church. Certainly, you must have an ID. You claim to be a Christian. You claim to be spiritual. Can I see your ID, please? Can I see your heart? Can I see what's inside? Or is it just external? Father, thank you. Thank you that you've never wanted something only on the external. What you value most, Lord, is our hearts. Father, I pray that I would have what constitutes for you the real ID. What really identifies me as your follower, your believer, your worshiper. And I pray that for everyone that hears this message, that they will not simply hide and justify themselves on some external ID, that they will allow the Spirit of God to search their hearts, and that they will be able to be honest with themselves as to whether their ID may only be on the outside has never reached on the inside. I pray for them. I pray for those that are courageously accepting and owning this reality. And I pray, Father, that all of us will not be satisfied where we are at. That none of us will feel that we've arrived and satisfied with what our parents taught us or what other pastors have taught us. Praise the Lord for their ministries in our lives. I'm thankful for Pastor Willie Caraballo, Lord, a United Methodist pastor that ministered to me at my youth. I'm thankful for him and his ministry. But Father, I cannot choose to be satisfied and simply feel, believe that I've arrived. But Lord, put in us a desire, a conviction daily to know you more, to know you more accurately. In Jesus' name, amen.
our next song is going to be Father, I Adore You. And we're going to do it in a round, so feel free to follow us at home. primary class. I'm here with a reminder. When we had talked about our class project, we had decided to sponsor a child, Menor, from Guatemala for one year. We were going to raise, collect, and give $35 a month to help feed him, clothe him, educate him. And I know we're not able to be in church right now, but that doesn't mean that we have to forget him. He still needs our help both financially and with our prayers. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're happy to be here with you again this morning. We hope you had a wonderful week, and we're ready to share another story with you. Um, our story this week is about a girl named Billa, and Billa is 17 years old. The story takes place when she is 10 years old. Are you guys ready to read? Mm hmm All right. Bella was 10 years old, and she lived at a boarding school in Kenya, and she got a telephone call. I have a big announcement, Mother said. I am moving to Finland to study nursing. Bella couldn't believe that Mother would leave her father, her sister, and her two brothers in Africa to travel all the way to Europe. She wasn't even sure where to find that on a map. I'm going because I want you to have a better life, said her mom. I will send for you as soon as I can. Billa wept. That means she cried. Go later, she begged. The wait proved to be very long. Five years passed, and during that time, Mother called often. She spoke about learning nursing and the Finnish language, and she said she was reading the Bible for the first time, and she was convinced that the seventh day, Saturday, was the Sabbath, not Sunday. Billa was surprised because the family had always gone to church on Sunday in their hometown. Mother showed her Bible verses about the Sabbath, and they saw that she was right. One day, Mother called to say she had found a church near where she was studying. It was a Seventh-day Adventist church, and they worshipped on Saturday, just as she had read in her Bible. Before I left Kenya, I prayed Take me to where people read your word, Lord, and where I will grow. My eyes have been opened in Finland, said Mother. Soon Mother was baptized, and she and the church members prayed for a way to get the rest of the family to receive visas and move to Finland. Finally, the government agreed, and Billa was so excited, she screamed into the phone when Mother broke the news to her. She had seen some of her classmates go on family vacations to Dubai, but she had never left Kenya. She thought only millionaires could travel, and mother was a nurse and father was a postman. But now she was going to live in Finland. After the excitement of the move, Bella discovered that life wasn't the same in Finland as it was in Kenya. First of all, the family arrived in January. What happens in January here? 
It snows. It snows. And the ground was covered with white, cold snow. She had never seen snow before. In Kenya, children politely addressed their teachers as Mr. and Mrs. In Finland, children called their teachers by their first names. So when Bella tried to call her teacher Mrs., the teacher replied, please don't call me that. It makes me feel very old. A year after she arrived in Finland, father became very sick and he fell into a coma in the hospital. Bella prayed the words of Jeremiah 32, 27, which says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? She prayed, God, you are a God who said this. Restoring my father's health is not too hard for you. Father woke up and six months later, he was released from the hospital. He gave his heart to Jesus and he was baptized. Bella and her sister and brothers were baptized too on the same Sabbath as their father. Moving to Finland has changed Bella's life. She used to only pray when she wanted to ask for help. Now she prays all the time and she thanks God for his goodness. She believes that God brought her family to Finland to learn about him. What a good story. Yeah. She learned God wants to hear from us all the time. He doesn't just want to hear from us when we have requests, does he? Mm -mm. He wants to hear when we have praises and when we want to say thanks for all the things he's given us. Isn't that right? Yeah. All right. Should we pray together? Yes. yes. Hudson, would you pray for us? Sure. All right. Go ahead. Dear Jesus, thank you for this good day that we're having. Help us to obey you and help us to get closer to you. We love you and keep us all safe. Thank you for the trees and the flowers, everything you created on Creation Week. We love you. Amen. 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 Thanks for listening to our story. We hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Bye. Hi. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, primary class. We miss you. Well, happy Sabbath again, and we have more fun, exciting, really interesting, I hope, Bible study for our class today. So to start, let's do our memory verse, and this is a really awesome one. In fact, I think a lot of you probably already know our memory verse. It's actually really short, so hopefully by the end of our lesson today, if you didn't already know it, everyone will have learned it. Are you guys ready? So our memory verse is going to be found in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So what do you think when you see that memory verse and you can see a big M for me? Who's it talking about, Andreas? If you love who? Jesus. Yes, yeah, so if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. And again, we are going to be listening throughout this story to lots of small stories about different kings in Judah. So we're going to be learning more about kings. And we're going to be learning about some kings that loved Jesus and some kings that did not. So last week we left off on our story. Who remembers he was actually a good king? He made a mistake. In fact, he probably made several mistakes. But we learned about one very big mistake he made. Does anyone remember what his name was? King Ahab. Oh, that was a good guess. King Ahab lived in Israel and we are down in Judah. And this was a good king named Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And do you remember his story where he wanted to, to do it God's way and he wanted to follow God? But remember, he got sick and he was going to die. And then the prophet came and he, he asked God, he prayed and asked for his life and God spared his life. And the prophet came back and said, yes, you will live for 15 more years. And remember what was the sign that he would live for 15 more years? Yes, Melania. The sundial went backwards 10 paces. Yes, so for 10 degrees, the sundial went back, which had never happened before, right? So he did. He did live for 15 more years. And our story today starts when King Hezekiah dies. In fact, I made a little chart, and I'm going to show it to you right now to give away a little bit of our story that we're going to be learning today. 
because there's so many names and these are all names of kings that we are going to be talking about in our story today. So our story starts where King Hezekiah dies and we're going to be learning about his son, his grandson, and his great grandson. So I will show you all my chart as well. And don't worry about these people yet because you are going to learn about all of these kings and our story. Okay. So good King Hezekiah has died and his son Manasseh became the next king when he was only 12 years old. Do you see a theme? A lot of these kings are starting becoming kings when they're still just children, aren't they? It's amazing to think about being a king when you're a child, right? So he was 12 years old. And who thinks that Manasseh chose to serve God just like his father Hezekiah had done? Oh, you're going to guess no? Well, that's a very yes. good guess. A super sad guess. It would have been really nice if he had wanted to live like his father and worship God. But let's see what the Bible has to say. So, uh, Alex, could you read Second Chronicles 33.9? Read it nice and loud, please. Second Chronicles 33.9. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do wrong. They did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed ahead of the Israelites. Isn't that so sad? They did even more evil than the nations that had been destroyed when the Israelites took over the land. Think about some of the stories way back, the Canaanites and some of the other people. We had learned that they did not love God and that they did a lot of sad evil. And now Judah, who should have had all the promises of God, is doing even more evil, led by their king Manasseh. In fact, we're told that Manasseh did such terrible uh, wickedness that he even sacrificed at least one of his children to the heathen God. Can you imagine sacrificing a baby to a God and thinking that that made that God happy? I wouldn't want to serve a God like that, would you? So Manasseh was so wicked. Not only did he allow his own children to get killed, but he also killed prophets or people that believed in God in heaven. And he led the people into worshiping the heathen gods. In fact, he even took an idol and put it into the temple, God's true temple. So God wanted so much to reach Manasseh, right? Who thinks that God really loved Manasseh? Are you sure? Would you really love somebody that would kill their own child? God did. God did. God's better than me because when I read that story, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I like Manasseh very well. But God loved Manasseh. In fact, God loved Manasseh just as much as he loved you or he loves you or me. Isn't that amazing to think about? It doesn't matter if you're good. It doesn't matter if you're bad. God loves you just as much. You are a child of God, aren't you? So God wanted so much to reach Manasseh and he kept sending him messages and he kept trying to touch his heart and Manasseh would not listen. But God, in his mercy, allowed something bad to happen to Manasseh. Mm -hmm. So Manasseh was actually taken a prisoner by another king. And in fact, when they got him, they put him in chains and they led him away and put him probably in a dungeon type prison cell. Not a place where I would want to be. And while he was there something wonderful happened. Now, when you think of your own life, sometimes when things are going really well, like think of a big, huge event that you've had, maybe it's in the middle of birthday time and you have friends over, you have a birthday cake, you're opening your birthday present. Is it easy always to stop and think about God? No, right? You're just having fun and everything's going well. Sometimes when things are going really well, we don't always think about God, do we? But what about when things are going really bad? You're feeling really sad about something. 
something unhappy has happened or you've been hurt, is it easier sometimes to think about God? Yes, I can think of times when all of you have been hurt. And what's one of the things that we, we want to do when you've been hurt? Pray. We want to pray, right? In that moment, we know we need God and we need his help and we pray. So that is what Manasseh did. Right there while he was a captive in his chains, he actually prayed to God for help. He started to recognize all the horrible, evil things he had done. And do you know what's amazing? God heard his prayer. Isn't God wonderful? God actually redeemed him. He went from being a captive to being able to go back to Jerusalem and be the king again. And he was able to be the king of Judah. And he was able to, to love God and to know that God in heaven was the true God, not the heathen idol gods. But we talked about this already last week. And Melania, you had answered this so well when you answered it last time. So if we do things, are there consequences for our actions? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? Mm -hmm. So were there consequences for King Manasseh, for him doing all those evil things and leading all the people in Judah to do very evil things? Was there consequences? Yeah. Yes, there was consequences, wasn't there? I actually brought a game with me which many of you I'm sure know. So just like Manasseh, what we do affects other people, doesn't it? Our choices affect not just us, but everyone around us. So it's kind of like this domino game, right? So when one domino gets knocked down, it affects all of them, doesn't it? And that's what happened with King Manasseh. And what can happen is we can actually repent and tell God we're sorry, right? And maybe this, this person, King Manasseh, repents and that person repents. And maybe this one sees that King Manasseh repented and they're sorry too. But does everybody repent? And does everybody get back up and love God and get back on the right path? Yeah. No. No. In fact, Ammon... He was Manasseh's son, was one of the people that was really hurt by sin. He didn't get back up, and he did not love God. So when his father Manasseh died, Ammon became the next king of Judah. But he was still not a good king. In fact, he was such a bad king that his servants chose to kill him when he had only been king for two years. Isn't that sad? We went good king, bad king, bad king. Have you ever gone to the park and been on a teeter-totter? Who's ever been on a teeter-totter? They're kind of fun, especially when you're little, right? And what do you know when you're on the teeter-totter? It goes... Bad. Uh, yes, up and down, right? Up and down. So some of the kings in Judah, they went up and brought the people towards God. And some of the kings in Judah went down, down and brought the people away from God. After Ammon was killed by his servants, we have another king. Now, if you remember in our story last week, we had little baby Joash, who then became king. This king has a very similar name, but a little different. His name is Josiah, and he was a good or bad king. We're gonna find we're gonna find out in just a minute. He was only eight years old when he became king. Do you remember little little baby King Joash that became king at? Seven. Seven. And now King Josiah at? Eight. Eight years old. Just the age you are, right? Eight years old. Would you like to be king? Wouldn't it be kind of scary a little bit at eight years old to be mm -hmm. king? So if, if Josiah was raised by Ammon and mm -hmm. grandfather Manasseh, who were both very bad, who thinks Josiah was bad? 
you have a 50% chance of being right, right? <laughs> he was either going to be bad in our story or he was going to be good in our story. Is he good? He was really good. In fact, he was wonderful in our story. So he had the wicked father, wicked grandfather. So why wasn't he wicked too? So what is one of the most major design principles that God has built his universe on? It's a wonderful one when you think about it. It is the principle of freedom, right? We have freedom to make decisions in this world. In fact, even angels in the universe have the freedom to make decisions. So even if your father and mother um, 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 believe in somebody else than God, um, you have the freedom to say that you um, are, uh, that you you have the freedom um, to um, believe in God. Yes, and that's what Josiah did. So we have a universe where God gives us freedom, but God gives us something else on our earth that is a complete wonderful blessing. It's often a quiet blessing that we don't think a lot about, but it's so important. God gives us the Holy Spirit. And do you know what the Holy Spirit job is? To draw us to God, isn't it? To kind of whisper in our ear, telling us the right path to go down. Try to help us understand when we see nature that there's a creator God and to help us want to come back and be with God. So Josiah decided to make the right choice and he decided that he loved God. Have you ever seen a pond that has a beautiful lily in it? Now, if you've ever been canoeing at Camp Asabo, you will know just what I mean. You go down that little bitty river stream, and sometimes when you get out to the bigger part where you're going to get into the big Asabo River, it can look full of cattails, and the water can look murky and full of weeds. But what do you see growing there? Lilies. Beautiful, beautiful water lilies. So they're just white and beautiful, although they're growing in a pretty ugly water or pretty ugly pond. And that's how sometimes our lives have to be. God does not want us to have to be in a bad situation. But even if we are, we can choose to, to worship God and to love him because we have freedom. In fact, I know most of the children that go to Sabbath school have a really nice family that they're living in, right? Most of the kids we know, they have good families that love God and bring them to Sabbath school. But even if you don't have a family that loves God, maybe in your family there's a lot of fighting, or maybe your parents are divorced, or maybe they're using drugs or alcohol or other sad things, you still have the freedom. You still have the choice to have Jesus in your heart. And you can be like Josiah that we're going to learn about today in our Sabbath school class. So the Bible tells us that Josiah was a very good king. In fact, Melania, can you read that for us in 2 Chronicles 34, 2? And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the and walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Very nice. Wouldn't you like that to be said about you someday? That you did not turn aside and you just walked in the way of God? That would be a beautiful thing to hear. So Josiah decided to repair God's temple. If you can imagine for a long time with King Manasseh and King Ammon, it had fallen into ruin. They cleaned it out. And while they were cleaning it out, they made a very important discovery. They found the book of the law probably in some box or in a, in a uh, basket or maybe somewhere where they had just shoved it to put it out of the way. And they were so excited. Imagine how excited the high priest was when he found that. And they brought it to Josiah and he opened it up. And he started to hear what it said as the scribe read it to him. And he realized it was a treasure of knowledge. I have a treasure of knowledge here in my box. This is something that all of us need to think of as a treasure, just like Josiah. 
Andreas, could you open that box for me and open it up and let's see what is inside? Oh, what's in there? Is Holy it Bible. the Bible is in our treasure box? Can you sit down? I'm going to have you read something from it in just a minute. Josiah decided that he wanted to obey what he was reading in the scripture that he found or they found in the temple. Only he was reading something that really concerned him. In fact, he was reading in the scripture about the consequences that would occur to the children of Israel if they did not follow God's best plan for how they should live their lives. And at this point, they had not been following it. And what he read was found in Deuteronomy 28, 64. Can you read this? And as you read it, listen and see why did this concern King Josiah so much. Then the Lord will um, scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other and which Neither you nor you, Father, have known wood and stone. Thank you, Andreas. So poor King Josiah, he sees that the people had been disregarding God for years, that they had not kept any of his commandments. And he knows that leads to sadness, and he knows something else. It's been told that a consequence of not obeying God, if not loving him and serving him the right way, that the people would end up being scattered and taken captive. Oh, he wants to please God, and he wants to bring the people back to God, and he doesn't know if it's too late to stop that prophecy from happening. So they take the scriptures, and they go to a prophetess. Holda, who lived in uh, Judah, and they come to her and they say, look what we found. What does God say? What will happen to us if we turn back to him? And she gives a very sad but hopeful prophecy. She basically says, it's too late. The course has been set. There's been way too many generations, too many kings that have led the people of Judah in the wrong path. And it's going to be too late for the people of Judah. They will go into captivity, but not yet. And there's still time for each person. There's still time for King Josiah and each person living in Judah to repent, to tell God they're sorry, and to be right with God. So again, we come back to the idea of consequences, right? So God was not necessarily punishing the people of Israel or in people of Judah. Both of them were going into captivity at different times in the way that we think of punishment, right? God wasn't angry at them. He wasn't um, trying to just get even with them because they wouldn't listen to that him. God wanted them to live the best way to protect them. And now he can't necessarily protect them because they're not living the way that he said that would be best for them. Plus, do you remember the story of Manasseh? Sometimes bad things have to happen, right? To truly bring us back to God. Yes, Melania. Um, their choices led to the consequences that, like, about how they were going to go into captivity. And they didn't want God, so God couldn't help them if they made a choice and they said, we don't want you. Because what did we learn about the universe? What's it based on? freedom, right? So God has to give freedom. When people say, no, 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 God, we don't want you. Eventually God has to say, okay, even though that makes him very sad, doesn't it? Here's some examples. How about you get a whole bunch of candy or you drink a lot of pop over many, many days and you don't brush your teeth very well and you get what? Decay. A decay and you end up with a cavity. cavity and you have to go see the dentist and the dentist has to give you a shot and you're like, ow, oh, ow. Oh. Then they have to pull it out. And, and is it the dentist is angry at you? Is that why he's giving you a shot and drilling in your tooth? Mm -hmm. Is he sitting there thinking, what a bad child. I'm going to give them pain because they did something that was foolish. Mm -hmm. No, the dentist probably feels kind of sorry, right? 
sees the child crying and feeling sad, I think the dentist probably just wants to help, feels bad that the child ate all that candy, drank all that pop, and has such a sad consequence. Here's another example. How about your teacher says, go study for your spelling test, and you choose not to study and do something else instead. And when you take your spelling test, you get every word wrong and you get an F. F minus. Did your teacher give you an F minus? Because your teacher's angry at you. No, it was because why? She wants uh, you to learn. She wants you to learn so that you can grow up and get a good job and know how to spell. But that's just a natural consequence of not studying, right? But in both those cases, the teacher would love to help you. If you came to the teacher and said, oh, teacher, I'm sorry I didn't study. I want to do better on my next test. Can you kind of tell me how? I bet your teacher would be so excited, wouldn't she? Mm -hmm. Or if you were at the dentist and you said, oh, I don't want to get another cavity. Can you show me how to brush my teeth well and to eat healthier food so that I don't get another cavity? Don't you think the dentist would be super happy? and say, yes, I'm so excited to help you. I would love to. And that's how it is with God, right? We have consequences for our actions, but what is God able to do? Forgive us. He can forgive us, but he can do even something even cooler. Help us not make those same choices. That would be best. Absolutely best. But even if we make a bad choice and we end up with a bad consequence, what amazing thing can God still do? He can actually take the badness and say, if you want to change and you're willing to walk with me, I can actually help make something good come out of the badness. Isn't that incredible? Only God is capable of doing that. Maybe after you've had your cavity and you've learned to eat healthy food, maybe you start telling other kids how to eat healthy and share it with them. That would be something good coming out of something bad, right? Isn't that awesome? God is so good. And that's what Josiah did. He led as many people back to repentance as he could, even though he knew it was too late for Judah. So guys, when we follow God, our lives are better. Our lives are happier. We have happier families. We have healthier bodies. And we can be a blessing to other people, can't we, when we follow God? But you know what else is super incredible when we follow God? It actually makes God happy. God created us because he loves us. He wanted to be friends with us. And when we can be a blessing and make God smile because, because he sees that we're happy and we're healthy and it gives a smile to God's his, his heart, wouldn't that be something you would like to do this week? I know for me, I would like to too. Let's say a prayer and ask, ask God to help us. Dear God in heaven, Thank you again for these wonderful Bible stories. Oh, Jesus is just like the teeter-totter, not only just in the Bible stories, but even in our own lives. Sometimes we go up and we feel close to you, and other times we go down and we don't feel very good and we do something that's sinful. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you forgive us. We praise you for that. And more than just forgive us, you can actually turn what looks like bad into something good and we praise you, praise you for that as well. Thank you, Jesus. Please be with us this week. Watch over each one of our class. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Let's say our memory verse together one last time. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Happy Sabbath. Hi, primary class. This is Miss Christy. I'm here for your nature nugget. I'm outside today with the dogs and I wanted to show you something that um, you learned in your lesson today. And that's a word called influence. Now influence is when we have an effect on other people and the way they behave and the things they do. And we always want that influence to be positive. And so I'm out here with my dogs. I was gonna show you what I do when I use the older dogs to influence or help train the younger dogs. So I've got two dogs with me. One is three. His name is Finley. He's going to be in the blue. And then I've got 
Kavik. He's not even one yet, and he's in the red. So I hooked them up together so I can train Kavik, since Finley knows all of his commands. And I'm gonna show you a few things that um, Finley can do that it helps to teach Kavik. So let me turn the camera around and then you'll be able to see the dogs in action. Hey. All right, G. 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 Good boys. All right, off. Good. Ready? Z. Good. Oop, I'm back. Off. Off. Up. Off. Good, Finley. Good, Kavik. Oop, Kavik, come. Good. All right, so as you can see, it's important that I have Finley trained really well because he's having an influence on little Kavik and teaching him the things to do. Now in our lesson, Manasseh, he was a wicked king most of his life and he had a very negative influence on a lot of the people around him. And even after he gave his heart to the Lord, there were still people doing bad things because of that negative influence he had had over their lives. So we wanna make sure that we ask God to help us to have a good influence on those around us and help us to encourage them to do the right thing. Happy Sabbath, you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.